Hello there. Hope you're doing well. I'm Hardleg Joe, if you didn't know, and here on this channel, my goal is to make politically themed videos. Specifically, videos aimed at explaining political concepts to people who normally wouldn't watch that kind of stuff. I think it's important for everyone to know about politics. It's something that'll impact literally every facet of your life, from the cost of Yu-Gi-Oh cards to when you die. It's not something that just some people should be into. Everyone can and should play a part in running the country, even if that just means discussing things with your friends and family. Of course, in order to have discussions, you kind of have to know what you're talking about first. And that can be kind of difficult, especially if you live in America. Not only is our education system pretty awful when it comes to explaining politics, but it feels like there's been a concerted effort to oversimplify things in the past couple decades. For example, there seems to be a lot of people who think that leftist, liberal, and progressive are all just different ways of saying Democrat. I sometimes hear people say things like, all mainstream media companies are run by Democrats, which is just not true. Most media companies are run by liberals, but you can be very liberal and have nothing in common with the Democratic Party. In fact, there are a lot of Republicans who are liberals, just like there are plenty of conservatives who aren't Republicans. Both politicians and media figures like to frame things as a battle between two sides, but politics isn't that simple. There's a whole spectrum of different ideals, and it's important to understand them if you want to have meaningful conversations about politics. Which you should. That's, that's what I'm all about. Regular people discussing politics. So in this video, I'm going to try to explain all the major political concepts as simply as I can. Now, small disclaimer, not everyone will agree on my explanations. Political ideals are complicated and they change over time. Some people prefer old definitions to new ones, and some people just have completely factually wrong notions about what certain political terms mean. However, the definitions I'm using in this video are the ones I'll be using on my channel, and they match up well enough with mainstream political science that you should be able to understand and communicate with the people who actually know what they're talking about. Anyway, the simplest way I can explain politics just as a whole is with a two-axis political model. This neat little grid is a nice way to visualize complex concepts. It's not the only political model, nor is it even necessarily the best one but it's much better than just grouping everything into two parties, and it should give you a good foundation to build upon if you want to do more research of your own. So how this works is there's two ideas we're looking at, economics and hierarchy. The left to right spectrum is the economic one. Specifically, it deals with how much industry is privatized versus how much of it is socialized. The right side represents private industry. If you don't know what that means, a private industry is one that is owned by someone and used to generate profits. You know, money. <laughs> Almost all businesses in America are privatized, so I'm going to assume you already kind of know the basics of how they work. By contrast, the left side of the spectrum represents social industries, which are far less common in America. Social industries aren't owned by anyone, and generally aren't concerned with making money. Instead, they are run for the benefit of society. Firefighters, for example, are a social industry. No one owns the firefighters, no one makes any money when they put out a fire. They exist so our towns don't burn down. It's the same idea with public schools, roads, libraries, the sewer system, stuff like that. We all kind of own it. Now in America, most social industries are run by the government and paid for with taxes. But that's not the only way you can socialize something. If you've ever used a credit union instead of a bank or shopped at a co-op market, those are socialized by the public. 
You could think of socialized businesses as being kind of like towns. Just because you found the town doesn't mean you own it. It's run democratically by the people who live there. In the case of a business, it's run democratically by the people who work there. And sometimes by the people who shop there as well. It depends on how the business is set up. Some are designed to break even and not make any profit, while others do make a profit, but they share that money with everyone who works there instead of just giving it to the owner. I bring up these examples because there's a lot of people who think that socializing an industry automatically means giving the government control of it. And that's not necessarily true. In fact, government control is the other axis of our chart, completely independent from the economy. I'll get to that in a moment, but first it's important to understand one additional quirk about this left-right spectrum, because it's not quite as simple as just counting the number of privatized industries. There's also the matter of regulations, which are laws that try to make private industries act more like social ones. For example, socialized companies tend not to pollute very much, because they exist for the benefit of everyone, and destroying the environment is quite detrimental to everyone. So, they will dispose of their waste properly, even if it's more expensive to do so. A private company, however, can do whatever the owner wants. So if all they want is to just earn money right now, and they don't care about the future impact of pollution, then they will gladly pollute all over the place if it saves them some money. In fact, that's exactly what businesses did for a long time until the government made regulations on pollution limiting how and where companies could get rid of their waste. In that sense, regulations are similar to socialization and that they result in a similar outcome. They limit what private businesses can do in order to make them act in the best interest of society. With enough regulations, you end up in a situation like what we have with the utilities. You know, water, gas, electricity. There's still plenty of privately owned utility companies in America, but they are so heavily regulated that they might as well be operated by the government. So, yeah, when it comes to the left versus right spectrum, it doesn't measure specific policies or laws, it measures their impact on society. Does the system benefit private business owners or the public at large? So looking at our chart, the farthest left you can go is 100% socialization of all industries with strict regulations on how those industries can operate. The farthest right you can go is 100% privatization of industry with no regulations at all. Now these two extreme points on the scale are objective. It's not possible to get farther right than the wall because what more can you do? There's nothing left to privatize or deregulate. Same thing with the farthest left point. Once all industry is socialized, you can go no further left. This means that every possible mix of these two extreme ideas is represented somewhere on the line between them. Now exactly where on that line any one country or person fits is kind of subjective because say we socialized all the food but privatized all the schools. How far left or right would that place us? It's kind of hard to put an exact number on it, which is why placing things on this chart is mostly a matter of opinion. However, as long as we all agree on the borders to this scale, we can at least have a logical discussion about those opinions. With these two absolutes as our framing device, we can make reasonable arguments for where we think we fit on the scale, and more importantly, where we'd like to be on the scale. For instance, here in America, the vast majority of industries are privately run, and pretty much every president since Reagan has worked to remove industry regulations. We do still have some social programs, like the firefighters, and we have strict regulations on some basic utilities, like water. But overall, I'd say we lean far more towards the private than the social. If I had to place our country on this line, it would be way to the right of center, probably three-fourths of the way to the wall. Now, if you disagree with that statement, feel free to give your thoughts down in the comments. It is debatable. 
But considering how many huge, barely regulated industries we have in this country, I think it's hard to argue that we're even close to being economically balanced, much less on the left. Of course, that's just one axis, and as the grid implies, we have two. I described it earlier as hierarchy, but it might be easier to think of it as power distribution. The lower you get, the more people have decision-making power in the government. The higher you get, the fewer people make decisions. This goes hand-in-hand hand with the idea of equality. Like, generally, the people who make decisions have more authority than the regular citizens do. A senator is not equal to you or me because they have the ability to directly impact the government, and we don't. And also, the laws don't treat us equally either. You would get in a lot more trouble for threatening a senator than you would for threatening me. This lack of equality means there's a hierarchy. Layers of power kind of organized like a step pyramid. In this case, there's a couple thousand politicians who are positioned above 300 million citizens. So, with that in mind, the bottom half of this scale represents the ideas of democracy. The lower you go, the more people have political power, with the very bottom being a pure, direct democracy. This is where everyone votes on every issue, and there are no elected leaders or positions of authority. Under this system, political power is distributed evenly among the entire population, which effectively means there is no government. Or rather, the government is indistinguishable from the citizens because literally everyone is an equal part of the government. This ideology is often called anarchism because it has the appearance of no government at all, even though there's still laws and rules that are enforced. I feel it's important to point this out because when people hear the word anarchist, they tend to think of someone who wants to smash things. But when it comes to politics, the idea of anarchy is less about creating chaos and more about distributing political power so evenly that there are no more hierarchies. So now that you understand the very bottom of the scale, let's talk about the top. This represents authoritarian ideas, which tend to like hierarchies. As you go higher, you get fewer people in charge who have more and more authority. As you could probably guess, the very top line here would be an absolute dictatorship, a totalitarian government, where all the powers of the government are given to one person who has supreme authority over everyone else. I could go more into detail about that ideology, but uh, unlike anarchy, I feel that most people have a solid understanding about what a dictatorship is. It's, uh, it's not a very complex form of government. Uh, but yeah, just like before, these borderlines are absolutes. You can't get more authoritarian than one person in charge, and you can't get more democratic than having everyone in charge. This means that, once again, the line connecting these two represents every possible compromise between those two ideals. Now, placing America on that line is kind of tricky. The USA was founded on a clear division of power between the people and the government. We are a democratic republic, which means we have leaders who possess more authority than the citizens, but they are democratically elected by those citizens and only serve for a set amount of time. It's a fairly balanced system with a lot of room for the citizens to check the government if it gets too powerful. So, if I was to plot 1700's America on this chart, I would probably put it right on the center line. Or, I guess, maybe a little above the center line, because originally not everyone could vote. Over the years that's changed, more people have gained the right to vote, but unfortunately the government has become significantly more authoritarian in other ways, specifically in regards to law enforcement. You may not think about it this way, but the police are an arm of the government, whose members have more authority than you do as a citizen. Like, they have the power to use violence against you if they think you're a threat, but it's against the law for you to fight back or even resist, even if the police are mistaken and you've actually done nothing wrong. 
This puts them in a hierarchy above you. And despite how natural it might feel to have a police force, those are actually a relatively new thing. There were no police in this country when it was founded. Back in the 1700s, crime was handled either by constables, who are democratically elected officials, or by the citizens themselves forming militias and posses. The fact that every town in America now has a police force makes our country more authoritarian. And unfortunately, they are just the lowest level of law enforcement. Above them, there's federal law enforcement, organizations like the FBI, the CIA, and Homeland Security, whose members have more power than the police do, and also the authority to use that power in secret with very little oversight. None of those organizations existed a hundred years ago, and none of the people in those organizations are elected. You have no direct control over how the FBI or the CIA is run. The closest you get is that you can vote for the president, who then picks the leaders of those organizations, which is not much comfort considering how powerful the president has become since the founding of our country. In fact, that's what my first political video was about way back on my gaming channel. I was worried that the office of the president had gained so much sway over federal law enforcement that it was approaching dictator levels of power. Fortunately, our current president doesn't seem interested in exercising that authority, but that doesn't mean he couldn't. It doesn't mean his replacement won't. These days, it seems like checks and balances are more a matter of the honor system than hard set rules. So if I had to chart us now, we'd be well above where we started, more than halfway between the center line and the top of this chart. Again, feel free to debate this down in the comments if you'd like, but personally, I feel like all the law enforcement combined with expanded presidential authority means that the power structure of our country is a rather large pyramid with us citizens at the very bottom. But I digress. Whether or not you agree with my placement, you can hopefully at least understand where I'm coming from, which again is the strength of this chart. It facilitates conversation. And now that we have our scale and an understanding of what some of the points on it mean, I can finally start clearing up some misconceptions and explaining some key political terms. For starters, I can combine the two points I made for America to show where I think the country is overall right now. From there, we can chart our two major political parties. And to be clear, I'm charting the parties themselves, like the actual politicians in them. You are a citizen, no matter who you vote for. You don't decide the policy of the political parties, you just pick the one you like. Whenever I say Democrats or Republicans, I'm not talking about you, I'm only talking about the politicians in those parties. You can prefer one side or the other, but you're not one of them, and you shouldn't consider yourself one of them either. So yeah, with that in mind, I think it's fair to say that Republicans are to the right of America as a whole. They have rallied against regulations and worked hard to privatize as many industries as possible. Even now, they advocate for things like more private schools and more private prisons to replace the social options that we currently have. As for their vertical placement, I'm going to move them up a few notches. This may seem kind of confusing to some of you, some of you that like the Republican Party, because they often sell themselves as the party of small government. But it's important to understand that having a smaller government isn't the same thing as having a less authoritarian government. This is a bit of a tangent, but usually the Republican small government policies boil down to one of three things. Uh, saying they want to lower taxes, cutting government spending, or giving more power back to the states. None of which gives you any more political power. Like, the United States doesn't lose the authority to tax you just because it chooses to tax you less. You might enjoy paying less taxes, but it doesn't give you any more say in how the government is run. Not unless, you know, you, you save a couple million in taxes that you can use for a campaign donation. Same idea with spending less. It might reduce the scope of the government if you defund a program or two, 
but the system only becomes less authoritarian if you defund something that has authority over the citizen, something like the CIA or the military even, which are things the Republicans always spend more on. And as for giving more power to the states, that just transfers authority from one part of the government to the other. There's really no difference between living in an authoritarian state and an authoritarian country. You're still subject to the will of elected officials, just now they're more local officials. Granted, there is an argument to be made about the importance of having localized power. It just has nothing to do with hierarchies. In fact, you could have a whole other axis that represents that spectrum completely independent from these other two. And some political models do that. For today, though, I'm trying to keep it simple. So we're working with the two most basic ideals. It's anarchy versus authority on this chart. And in that regard, I think the Republicans clearly want to make things more authoritarian. As for the Democrats, let's look at their economics first. Some of them would like to socialize health care. And some of them would like the Green New Deal, which is a bill that would regulate businesses both to make them pollute less and give more rights to their workers. These are both left-leaning economic policies, but they're the only major leftist policies they have. Most Democrats don't support them, and even if both of them somehow passed, they wouldn't affect a majority of the private industries in America. So if I had to chart the Democratic Party, they would be here, to the left of America as a whole, but still very much to the right of the center line. And now perhaps you could see the difference between a leftist and a Democrat, and why many leftists don't like the Democrats. Because the Democratic Party is clearly on the right side of the political spectrum. They are only left in comparison to the Republicans. There are European countries with more well-rounded political systems that have parties all over this grid, and they would consider the Democrats to be a center-right party, which is what I consider them as well. America has no real leftist party. As for their vertical alignment, I'd also move them up. Not as much as the Republicans, but still up. Democrats have no policies I know of that would move the needle down. There's talk of defunding the police, but that seems even less popular with the Democrats than socialized healthcare is. And there's zero talk of reducing presidential power or the military. In fact, they've consistently voted to give more funding to the military, which is why they go up. The only reason they aren't as high as the Republicans is because much of their rhetoric right now seems focused on returning to the status quo, which means trying to keep things the same, more or less. Speaking of the status quo, though, let's talk liberals. Now, the idea of liberalism actually goes way back to the Enlightenment, when the people of Europe started to rebel against their kings and queens. The four core tenets of liberalism are democracy, equality, individual freedom, and economic liberty. That last one is basically the freedom to own a private business, by the way. That, that'll be important later. But yeah, because those are such broad ideals, liberalism covers a huge chunk of the political spectrum. It encompasses the entire bottom right square and stretches up into some of the others as well. It doesn't go much farther left than the center, because at that point you're losing the economic liberty aspect, and it stops short of the top, because at that point you're losing the democracy and equality. However, you'll notice that both of America's political parties are well contained within the liberal square. Which means, both parties are technically liberals. In fact, they always have been. Because the United States is a liberal country, founded on liberal ideals from the Enlightenment. How the Democrats in particular came to be associated with the term liberal is a long and complicated story, but needless to say, almost all Republicans are liberals as well. Though it might be more accurate to call them neoliberal, which is a more refined subsection of liberalism. It emphasizes the importance of right-wing economics and limited democracy. Basically, it's what we have now. 
We live in a neoliberal society, and we have since the 1980s. You probably grew up being taught in school that private businesses and representative democracy were the best things ever, and that any ideas outside this neoliberal box were destructive or even evil. Now, when you go online, you might hear a lot of people talking down on liberals. Uh, owning the libs is kind of a meme. Oftentimes, this just comes from, like, right-leaning Americans who think that liberal means the same thing as Democrat. But more times than not, this criticism comes from politically informed people who have beliefs that lie somewhere outside that liberal square. For example, if you go above the liberals into more authoritarian territory, you get fascism. Fascist ideology rejects democracy and equality because it believes that some people are superior to others, and therefore, those people deserve more power and rights than everyone else. There's also a cultural element to fascism, but for the sake of this chart, we're just going to talk about its relationship to hierarchy, because fascists love hierarchy. They think the government should consist of a single leader who makes all the decisions, a single political party that supports that leader, and a class of powerful police to violently enforce the leader's will. The citizens at the bottom have no power whatsoever. They're just workers and consumers who exist to serve the government. Fascists also tend to believe there are undesirable people below the citizens, people who need to be removed from society in order to keep it running. I'm not sure if you necessarily have to be racist to be a fascist, but Historically, they've always been racist, or at the very least bigoted against some minority. Because that's the simplest justification for their politics. Like, it's easy to make a government with strict hierarchies when you have a worldview that divides people into different hierarchies. I should be clear, though, these people hierarchies are always entirely arbitrary. Modern fascists will often go out of their way to claim their ideology is backed up by science, but if you actually look into their research, it is seriously flawed, to put it lightly. The categories they place people into are not well-defined and often change with time. The only consistent category is the one they belong to, which just happens to be the most superior category. And the only evidence they cite to prove this superiority is cherry-picked examples which ignore the overwhelming evidence against them. What I'm saying is, fascist ideology isn't just or logical. Fascists just want to be at the top of a pyramid. They want power, and they came up with a bunch of excuses to explain why they should have it. Don't be tricked by them. A lot of people get easily swayed when someone tells them they're special or superior, especially when that someone is a charismatic leader who's promising big changes. But unless you're a politician or a police officer, your life will only get worse under fascism. Because you're just another disposable citizen. A worker who will get tossed aside as soon as you've outlived your usefulness to the leader. But yeah, I suppose while I'm talking about fascism, I should briefly talk about anti-fascism, or Antifa for short. This is an anarchist ideology that opposes fascism, sometimes violently. There's often this claim that uh, Antifa members are the real fascists because they use violence. But violence isn't exclusive to any part of this chart. Pretty much every ideology uses violence sometimes, I mean... Our laws right now are enforced with violence. That's what the police are for. We, we have the death penalty. The government will literally kill you if you break the law. The important thing here is not violence itself, but who does the violence and what their justification is. Fascists advocate for a system where the government can use violence against anyone for pretty much any reason they want. Antifa thinks that such a system would be so awful that citizens should go to any lengths to prevent it, including the use of violence if necessary. This violence is supposed to be aimed exclusively at fascists and their organizations, but because of Antifa's anarchist roots, that isn't always the case. 
Their connection with anarchism, though, also explains why there's some confusion as to whether or not Antifa is an actual organization. There's certainly groups of Antifa who work together, but they are anarchist groups. They have no hierarchies, which means no leaders, and no organizational structure. It's kind of like uh, if you go to a park, you might see a bunch of kids running around playing tag. But those kids probably aren't part of a team. They didn't plan to meet up. Hell, they might not even know each other. Most likely, they went to the park because they saw it was a nice day out, and they knew other kids would show up who would also want to play tag. Antifa is kind of like that. If people know that fascists are going to be doing something in public, then anti-fascists will show up to stop them. They might come in small groups, they might work together once they arrive, but it's kind of hard to call them an organization because there's nothing really organizing them aside from a shared dislike of fascism. But yeah, that's enough about the top of the chart. Let's move to the left of the liberal square. The people here are some manner of socialist. They tend to reject the economic parts of liberalism because they feel that private businesses interfere with the other parts of liberalism, specifically the democracy and equality parts. The simplest example of this is slavery. Like, an extreme right-winger might reason that they should have the freedom to buy anything they want, including other people. And the leftist counter to that is no, because if we allow you the freedom to own slaves, that creates inequality and weakens democracy. Because even if you treat all the slaves well, you've still built a hierarchy where you have significantly more power and freedom than they do. And even if those slaves can vote, the fact that you control their entire lives means you control the information they get, which lets you sway how they vote. Now, of course, you don't have to be a socialist to agree with that sentiment. I'd like to think that most people think slavery is wrong. Socialists just take that idea a couple steps further by pointing out that private businesses create a similar dynamic. Like, uh, in order for any business owner to make a profit, they must exploit their employees. And I mean that in, in a literal sense. If you do $10 worth of work, your boss doesn't pay you $10 for it, because if they did, they wouldn't make any money. They'd just break even. Business owners have to pay you less than what you're worth in order to make any money. That's just how the system works. The less they pay you, the more money they make, which incentivizes them to exploit you as much as possible, to pay as little as they can get away with. And the bigger a company is, the more people it employs, the more extreme this exploitation becomes. Big national companies can employ tens of thousands of workers at the minimum wage possible. Together, all these employees get a ton of work done while being paid very little in the process. This generates billions of dollars in exploited money for a handful of private business owners who become so ridiculously rich that they can use that wealth to influence democracy either directly by donating it to politicians and lobbying groups, or indirectly by purchasing the media companies that influence voters. A socialist might argue that people shouldn't be free to own a business for the same reason they shouldn't be free to own slaves, because it creates a hierarchy where the owners have significantly more power and freedom than their employees do. And even though the employees can vote, the wealthy owners control so much of the media and the government that they effectively control the information that voters have access to, letting them sway public opinion to their side. I mean, there's a reason you've probably never heard socialist ideas explained in these terms before. Big businesses have poured billions and billions of dollars into propaganda against socialism because they would like to continue exploiting you for profit, and socializing industry is a big threat to that. That's why I'm spending a little bit more time on this than the other ideologies, because living in a neoliberal society, I doubt you've heard an honest description of socialism before, and you should at least have a decent idea of what it represents before you decide how you feel about it. Speaking of ideologies that don't get accurately described often, 
Let's talk communism. This is the leftmost side of the spectrum, and it starts when you have 100% socialization of all industries. Under communism, no business is owned by individuals. It's all run by the government or democratically by the citizens, which is important to note. A lot of people think you need an authoritarian government to be communist, but the ideology actually covers the whole left wall from the top to the bottom. The communism you probably think of when you imagine, like, the Soviet Union would be somewhere in this upper left-hand corner. Modern political scientists often call this state communism because all the businesses are in the hands of a government or state. It's entirely possible, though, to have democratic communism or even anarcho-communism if you want. In fact, many of the people who push for communism these days advocate for something far less authoritarian than what the Russians did, because who honestly wants to live under a dictator? I won't dwell on this too long because there's actually, like, several different versions of communism with their own ideas on how power should be distributed, and many of them have important elements that can't be accurately represented on this chart. Like, uh, I'm pretty sure Marxist communism is supposed to be completely moneyless, which kind of defies the very concept of an economic scale. But yeah, needless to say, not everything you've been told about communism is true. A lot of these same people who have financial reasons to lie about socialism also lie about communism. Even if you don't like the idea, I'd advise you to do more research on it, see what communists have to say about it, so you can at least understand what it actually is. For now, the main thing I want to impart is the difference between a communist and a socialist. Because a lot of people seem to think they're the same thing. And I guess, to be fair, it can be kind of confusing. Because, like, all communists are socialists. You only reach communism by socializing everything. But not everyone who likes socialist ideas wants to go all the way to communism. You can support moving left without wanting to go as far as possible. And even socialists themselves exist on a sliding scale. I mean, this whole block represents different kinds of socialists. There's some people who just want to socialize the essentials, like food, water, housing. There's market socialists, who think businesses should be run democratically, but that those businesses should still compete with each other for profits. And I mean, there's also people firmly on the right side of the chart who just want to socialize healthcare. Socialist policies aren't an all-or-nothing prospect. You can implement them on an individual basis and in several different ways. Now, speaking of the right side of this chart, though, there is one more area I haven't really talked about, which is this bottom right section. These are the people who like right-wing economics and private business, but think that political power should be distributed much more evenly. In Europe, these people are often called classical liberals to differentiate them from neoliberals. In America, though, these ideas are called libertarian, which you may be familiar with because the Libertarian Party is actually one of the few third-party options that has nationwide representation, even if they only get like 2% of the vote. Unlike the small government policies put forth by Republicans, libertarians actually push for laws that would make the government less authoritarian. They don't just want to lower taxes, they want to take away the government's ability to tax you. And as a result, they want to reduce funding for all government programs, but especially ones that can kill you or spy on you, like the police or the CIA. And not only do they want to limit the power of law enforcement, they also want to reduce its scope as well. They tend to advocate for things like the legalization of drugs, prostitution, and abortion on the grounds that the government shouldn't have any say on what you do with your body. By making more things legal, they weaken the authority that law enforcement has over you. Less laws to enforce means less excuses to use violence against the citizens. Which seems like a pretty logical stance to take if you actually want the government to meddle less in people's lives. Of course, they seem to have no problem with private businesses meddling in people's lives, because as a very right-wing ideology, they usually want to remove government regulations 
which would allow businesses to exploit their employees even harder than they already are. Now, to be fair, I haven't looked as deeply into libertarianism as I have the other ideals on this chart. I've heard some of them say that companies will treat their employees and the environment better if the government regulates them less. But I find that very, very hard to believe. As both a customer and an employee, I have never felt like any business had my best interest in mind. In my experience, if a company can screw me over to make a buck, it will. So while I appreciate their policies against authoritarianism, I can't really get on board with, with libertarian economics. But speaking of my opinion, now that I've covered most of this chart, I suppose I should tell you where I belong on this spectrum, if, if nothing else for the sake of transparency. To be truthful though, I don't exactly know yet. Somewhere in this bottom left square, I think, but it's, it's hard to be sure. I don't have a specific ideology I subscribe to because I'm not sure any one ideology has all the answers. I don't think the solutions to our problems are already written in a book somewhere. I think those solutions will be forged through discussion and compromise, by taking the best parts of several ideologies and crafting some kind of hybrid system. The one thing I believe in for sure is the power of democracy. I think that we, as people, get the best results when we pool our collective knowledge and work together to improve things. And as a result, I tend to favor the left side of this chart, because I think that the big companies have way too much power, and they're clearly using that power to erode our democracy. If our republic is to survive, I think we need more industries to be run for the benefit of the citizens, instead of the profits of a few. Maybe not all the businesses, but definitely more than we have now. And the ones that do stay private need to be regulated much more heavily, so that they can't exploit people to the point of poverty or mislead them with lies and propaganda. Preferably, these socialized industries would be run by the workers and not by some unelected government bureaucrat. Like I said, I believe in democracy, so applying democracy to economics, having industries run by the people for the people, sounds like a damn good idea to me. Now how realistic that is to implement, I don't know. Politics and economics encompass literally everything, and I'm not an expert on everything. No one is. But I know enough to recognize that the system we're using now isn't working very well. And we're already way too authoritarian and way too right-wing for me to think that going farther in either of those directions will help. So my official stance is, I'm for any policy that moves us down or to the left. Which means, whether you're a libertarian or a communist or a centrist who just wants to find a balance between all these things, I consider you an ally. We may not agree on everything, but so long as you want more democracy or more socialization, then we can agree on some things, and I'm willing to work together to achieve those things. If you take away anything from this video, I hope it's that mentality. You should understand all the different political ideologies, but don't get too caught up in choosing one to define yourself. Any kind of political action is going to take a lot of people, more than any one of these specific ideologies can support alone. If you just pick one point on this chart and close yourself off to compromise, you'll end up too small and too inflexible to accomplish anything. That's why I think it's more important to pick a direction you want to go and team up with anyone who can help you get there. Like, there's not a lot of people willing to commit to full-on socialism right now, but I think there's a lot of people willing to move left from where we are. And regardless of which group you're in, both of you benefit from that alliance. As cheesy as it sounds, if we could just look past our differences and work together on the things we do agree on, 
then I think we could actually change our country for the better. It's just a matter of getting people informed. But yeah, that just about wraps this up, though I should briefly talk about what it means to be a progressive. That word is often synonymous with Democrats or the left in general, but progressive ideas have more to do with culture than economics or hierarchy. Like, uh, trans rights is a progressive idea, because it progresses culture past where it is now, by giving more rights to people who currently don't have any. Arguing against that progress is what it means to be a conservative. Conservatives want to conserve the culture we have now, which means no more new rights for LGBT people, and possibly even rolling back some of the recent rights they've gotten, like repealing same-sex marriage. Being regressive means wanting to push culture back even further to how it used to be in years past. A regressive might say that not only should gay marriage be illegal, but homosexuality itself should be illegal. Now these cultural ideas aren't really charted on this spectrum, at least not directly. Like you could be a conservative and a leftist, those aren't mutually exclusive, but the underlying philosophy behind those ideals might be. Remember before how I said fascists tend to be racists? Well, racism is a socially regressive ideal based on the belief that people aren't equal, just like fascism is. If you're the kind of person who thinks we need political hierarchies, it's likely you think we need social hierarchies too. Racism, sexism, homophobia, and fascism all stem from this core philosophical belief that some people are just inherently worse than others. This same idea works in reverse, too. The people at the bottom of the spectrum tend to be more progressive because being pro-democracy means accepting that people are generally equal and deserve a voice, which goes hand in hand with giving equal rights to everyone. This applies to the left versus right as well. Leftist ideology is based on the premise of doing things for the benefit of everyone, which is something that appeals to people who care about others and don't want to see them suffer. That empathy is the same motivation behind progressive social movements, which is why progressives and the left are so often intertwined. Right-wing ideology, by contrast, tends to be more callous or self-centered. The people who support private industry don't seem to care if others suffer or die under their system, so long as they can personally benefit from it. Likewise, they don't care if someone is being oppressed by the government, unless that someone is them. Now, all that being said, I've met empathetic right-wing people who give a lot of money to charity. And I've met people who are socialists not because they care about others, but because they're worried about private industries killing them through environmental destruction. My point is, Culture doesn't chart exactly onto this spectrum. Which is why some people have argued that the two-axis model isn't enough. That it needs a third axis to measure culture. Progressiveness versus regressiveness. And in fact, there's already another popular political model called the Eight Value System, which measures economics, hierarchy, culture, and diplomacy which is defined as the balance between local power and global power. Essentially, it's a measure of how large any one government should be, and it's what people are usually talking about when they argue for states' rights. As I said at the start, this two-axis model is not the only way to look at politics, or even the best way. It's just better than dividing everything into two parties. No model can accurately depict the complexities of real life. All they can do is provide a useful framework for us to discuss things. In my opinion, these two issues, economics and hierarchy, are the two most important issues facing us right now. Most of our problems can be tied back to one of these two things, and most of the videos on this channel will be about them as well. Understanding them and your relationship to them is the first step towards taking meaningful political action. Now that you know left from right, authoritarian from democratic, and all the spaces in between, 
you should be able to discuss politics much easier, and maybe even have some idea of where you'd like this country to go. You might also be able to understand other political content as well, and identify when someone knows what they're talking about, and when they're just trying to push the same old, tired, two-party narrative. Obviously, I hope you'll stick around on this channel for the other videos I have planned, but don't forget that there's a whole other world of perspective out there to learn from. You can't get it all from me. Regardless, that's it for now. Thank you for watching, and until next time, stay safe out there.